started. Can I turn now to our second uh, keynote speaker, Professor Carl Becker, Dean of the Arts at Columbia University in New York, Professor of the Arts since 2007, a former Dean of Faculty and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs at the School of Art Institute in Chicago, where she was at that stage Professor of Liberal Arts. Her research interests are feminist theory, American cultural history, South African art and politics. Very widely published, very widely listened to in extensive public lectures, and the recipient of many academic awards, honors, including, it should be said, a degree from this university, an honorary doctorate some years ago, which we were delighted to confer on her. So welcome, Carl Becker, and we look forward to your presentation. Dormagi, thank you. to say it is totally wonderful to be back in Ireland. And it's an honor to be with you, Mr. President, and with such luminous colleagues. I could call this paper several things. Um, I could call it Beyond Innovation, or Where Ideas Come From, um, or Creativity. You can decide. For the past few years, I've been asked to speak at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, when I received my first invitation to this event, I was quite surprised, since art school deans do not usually find themselves in this very high-powered world of heads of business and economics, CEOs of major corporations, university presidents, or the likes of Bill Gates, Bill Clinton, Bono, or Angela Merkel. Over time, however, the logic of these invitations has become more clear. Increasingly, there is recognition that creativity is essential to all fields, and the World Economic Forum now is taking art making, usually relegated to the generally denigrated category of soft skills, along with all other aptitudes that involve emotions, a lot more seriously. There is a race for innovation that is especially driven by technology, and no one wants to be left behind. It has become obvious to many that artists might have the skills and disposition with which to generate new ideas. The invitations to the forum have also been the direct results of sessions that I've developed at Columbia University with the Global Leadership Fellows. These are approximately 50 individuals in their 20s and 30s from all around the world, representing a wide variety of disciplines whom the World Economic Forum envisions as potential leaders. Each year, after a week spent at the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, their new co cohort is invited to Columbia University School of the Arts to engage in voice training, theater exercises, and community building based on the methods of Augusto Boal. This week-long program is designed to promote the success of these young leaders as communicators by encouraging them to cultivate their authentic voices while standing firmly on the ground, projecting their ideas through language and the body. For a panel discussion during a dinner session about leadership and creativity at One Davos Forum, my fellow panelists were the deans of the London School of Economics, Harvard Business School, Kellogg School of Management, INSEAD in Paris, and business schools in Moscow. The CEO of Ernst & Young chaired the conversation. At this event, I learned that my colleagues were concerned that their graduates had become very homogenized. As one dean put it, all the students we accept are interesting when we admit them, but by the time they leave us, they're all the same, and they want the same job. These institutions recognize that something is missing in the way they're educating their students, and they hope that art school educators like me might have something to teach them. If we agree that new ideas, unorthodox and inspired, are essential to the future well-being of society, and that increasingly, for ideas to help solve global problems, they need to move both deep and wide, within and across disciplines. Then we have to ask these questions. Where do ideas come from? How can they best be cultivated? In my thinking, ideas come from the particularity of individual thought, which is most effectively accessed when we cultivate the totality of each person. All types of consciousness, the rational mind, the unconscious world of dreams, unexpected associations, imagination, fantasy, play, and intuition must have room to develop. If people are cut off from these multiple intelligences, 
then they cannot access their total self or full creative potential. Artists understand this and actively draw upon and cultivate many thought levels. So the study of art is structured to encourage the liberation of multiple forms of consciousness. To foster creativity and innovation more broadly, why not make such an environment which crosses boundaries of disciplines and does not privilege one type of consciousness over another, part of the education of students in all fields. Each person needs to be encouraged to develop his or her unique talents and follow his or her path, whatever those might be, even when directions taken might deviate from expectation. Cultivating this uniqueness might make it difficult for everyone to fit into the typical categories of work and personhood that societies have structured to make us all feel more secure. But to promote creativity, we need to destabilize these categorizations, not reify them. To address what art schools might contribute to this conversation, the following enumerates my own sense of the originary and often unspoken premises upon which a school of art is built. So one, to begin. First, we try to admit the most talented and unique students, knowing that other parts of Columbia University might find our chosen students wanting in competitive test scores or other conventional measures of academic potential. Nonetheless, we are confident in our ability to recognize what we understand as talent to succeed in the arts, such as the ability to enact unique forms of problem solving by combining form and content, and the ability to communicate the relationship between the subjective and the collective through images and narrative. Two, once we bring to campus a group of students whom we think have such aptitude, we create a holding environment, a potential space, as psychoanalyst W.D. Winnicott might say about the psychoanalytic environment, where students feel secure enough to push themselves into unknown terrain, to experiment, to take risks, and even to fail. Artists create the problems they choose to solve and then are compelled to follow the sequence of thought and action that this path generates, wherever it might lead. The pedagogical environment must be both consistently challenging and equally supportive. The analogy with the psychoanalytic model is a good one because those who educate artists also must encourage the unconscious dreams and the imagination in order for the work to be accomplished. Three, contrary to the hierarchies of most institutions, art schools try to allow the practices of each new group of artists to influence the thinking of older generations in relationship to the evolution of the curriculum. We know that many artists succeed in the art world when they are young, and we accept that these young artists might develop the most startling ideas and influence the field in extraordinary ways. We therefore value the irreverence of youth, pushing against the confines of tradition. In this premise, we are like the sciences. Four, unlike the sciences, however, we do not ask that recently generated knowledge be verified or proven. When presented with new, unexpected work, we discuss its success and effectiveness. We never ask, is it art? Also, unlike the sciences, the experiment and thinking that art represents cannot be replicated unless it is designed to be, such as Andy Warhol's or Keith Haring's prints or multiples. If a painting can be easily reproduced, its artistic value might be questioned and then the work itself might be perceived as commercial art or entertainment. Most Renaissance, pa Renaissance painters, for example, painted or drew the story of the virgin and child, but a Bellini depiction of this scenario still appears unique and is easily recognized from across most museum galleries. Even if one does not know it is by Bellini or even who he is, the painting arrests our vision and distinguishes itself from others that are less successful. Our eyes are drawn to it. Only Bellini himself could make another. In this sense, the work is unique. Five, we encourage play. Play opens space in the human psyche. In play, all is possible because both the mind and spirit are fluid and relaxed. It is in this state of receptivity that new ideas often emerge. Play, therefore, is essential to all ages and must be nurtured. It is the force that triggers the imagination. And as Schiller says, in play, we are our most human. 
Six, we revere imagination as the source of creativity. Creativity generates innovation, which we can understand as applied creativity. Art schools generally do not use the word innovation because they are process-oriented, and innovation implies instrumentalized creativity focused on a particular goal or application. Process yields results, but they are often not the results we anticipated. One has to welcome the surprises that emerge and follow the pathways they open up in order for ideas to breathe themselves into existence. Seven, because we believe that hybridity, the mixing of elements and disciplines, can precipitate new knowledge, we encourage the blending, reconfiguring, and intertwining of forms. We accept that such experimental practices may lead to failure, but we do not fear failure. We are often more interested in ambitious failure than in a more modest success. Try again, fail again, fail better, said Beckett. Art schools are about failing better. Eight, we also believe that what at first might appear as failure could lead to success. Studying the work, the early work of Miro at the Joan Miro Foundation in Barcelona, it is clear that Miro's freedom as an artist came early and ironically was directly linked to his inability to render or draw representationally. If he had possessed Picasso's innate graphic skills, he might never have invented his own unique iconography, his own set of symbolic images. Inversely, if Picasso, who could render perfectly from the age of seven, had been endowed with a temperament to be satisfied with his own success as a superlative draftsman, he might not have discovered cubism with George Brock. These eight assumptions make clear that the entry point for creative knowledge and achievement is not necessarily the mind alone, but also the instincts, senses, and innate ability. Those with the most cultivated philosophical minds are not necessarily the best artists and are not always able to imagine unique metaphors or achieve the greatest success. It is often those who use their minds in conjunction with their dreams, fantasies, and intuition who are best able to make interesting and effective art. By relaxing their expectations and inhibitions, they are often those most receptive to the state of Wu Wei, letting things happen, as the Tao Te Ching suggests. In such pedagogical environments where we cultivate the freer consciousness that allows art, writing, theater, film, and other forms to emerge, we rarely talk about creativity, in part because it is beneath, behind, and in front of everything we do, like air. What constitutes creativity? Why is it valued, romanticized, mythologized, commodified, and even feared? Creativity is the ability to imagine what does not yet exist, and innovation is one of its possible outcomes. Creativity depends completely on the courage of each person to live in the hard to articulate space of flow, or the zone where multiple forms of consciousness, often hidden and unknown to the conscious mind, are manifested and given shape. It exists most strongly in those able to tolerate the tension between the conscious and the unconscious. What emerges often surprises even those who imagined it into being. How can that be? How can artists sometimes be so uncertain about the source of the work, writers so unclear about where the story wants to go, or scientists surprised by their own hunches and how these pan out, as one might say when prospecting for gold? Parts of our consciousness are not always aware of each other, so sometimes we surprise even ourselves. Perhaps hunches are actually one form of consciousness making itself known to another, light seeping into density. Practitioners that maintain this state of receptivity allow themselves to be led by parts of themselves that might be unknown to their conscious minds. This situation makes the process of the work fundamentally irrational. Theosophists might say that creative work emanates from the subtle body. Buddhists might refer to it as the primordial or originary, as distinct from the acquired. Freudians might call it the unconscious, Jungians the act of imagination, while some formalists might insist that artwork emerges from form alone, the juxtaposition of color, shape, and texture that combine to generate images. When we categorize the artistic process, it could be understood as research. 
not just the preparation for the actual making of the work, but also the full immersion into the subject that allows for open-endedness and a constant uncertainty and evolution of knowledge not always apparent in the finished work. This is the research that artists conduct. Art making, like scientific inquiry, is based on discovery, but artists' research process and the findings that result are often deemed subjective and therefore are usually not as highly valued or as well supported financially as so-called objective scientific experimentation. Even though the work only emerges through the artistic process and it is from this process that others have the most to learn, the process itself is not valued. What is valued, however, literally given value, is the art object. This physical manifestation of ideas receives great attention in and out of art schools and within the transactions of the marketplace. It is from these actions and non-actions that art and art making create utopian space, an interpretation of that which is in terms of that which is not, as Rousseau has written. No matter the content, the fact that such ideas could be imagined and externalized by the imagination means that the particularity of individual seeing has been brought into the public sphere. Art is utopian because it allows for an individual vision to become communal through the use of narrative, shape, color, texture, complexity, sound, movement, or whatever elements are needed to translate a project's intention to the consciousness of others. Such a belief assumes the utility of art making to demonstrate that the material world begins in ideas, in the incorporeal, and ideas such as democracy, equality, and human rights can transform the world. Art making manifests the notion of dreaming the world into being, the opposite of immobilizing skepticism. It is an archaic, wish-fulfilling practice, but also a revolutionary one. It is a form of action, as Hannah Arendt might say. Today we see this type of thinking strongly reflected in environmental movements. To create a sustainable future, one must start by reconceptualizing our daily life from the bottom up, from what we eat and how we grow it, to the light bulbs we choose for our homes and the alternatives to fossil fuel we discover or how we create them. The species needs to reorder its relationship to the physical world. We need new ideas to do this, or we need to recognize that an old idea like sustainability, which is an ancient Native American concept, remixed, must be brought back into all spheres to solve serious global problems endangering the health of the planet and its inhabitants. The rigid categories and disciplines of thought with which we have tended to conceptualize problems have made it impossible for us to address them effectively, to address the world's organic complexity, which mirrors our own. Those with the most extravagant imaginations do have unique abilities with which to approach problems as they bring multiple forms of consciousness and bodies of knowledge to bear. This is why groups like the World Economic Forum are interested in schools of art. They know that these creative environments are not invested in the status quo. They recognize that creativity is the key to innovation and that innovation moves societies and markets forward. I am not sure they completely understand that this focus on imagination goes hand in hand with a radical critique of existing societal and institutional structures. But once we open up such profound possibilities of reorganization, the social order inevitably comes into question. Such subversions are essential if the species is to survive. Those individuals and institutions that fearlessly encourage invention and recognize its source, the imagination, will lead the way. Thank you.